Hi, my name is Lieutenant Commander John Allison, Blue Angel Number 5, and lead solo pilot for the United States Navy Blue Angels. Uh, my dad had a small airplane, and it just got me very, very interested in it. You know, you know obviously he would let me fly a little bit, and uh, I just liked it. I was attracted to it from the start. Started taking some lessons from him. He was an instructor. I just loved it. Absolutely loved it. And I got my pilot's license before my driver's license, actually. What's impressed me the most about this team is that the level of teamwork, the level of professionalism basically eclipses anything that I've ever seen. These guys are great. For me, it's a little slice of America. But I feel that anybody can do this. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your background. If this is what you want to do, you can do it. And that's, that's why I fly airplanes. That's why I fly for the Navy, and that's why I do what I do. Because if one kid walks away from this show thinking that he can do something he didn't think was possible, then we, we did our jobs.
Every time I open the hangar door to go flying, I realize that I'm one of the lucky guys doing something that I dreamt of as a kid.
This is the Feastless Storch, an ironical reminder to United Nations representatives charged with the disarmament of Germany. The fabric-covered Storch was developed during peacetime, but was later modified, armed with a 30 caliber machine gun, and became the most widely used observation and liaison plane in the German Air Force. The inner wing sections operate as flaps, the outer sections as ailerons. A 240 horsepower air-cooled engine gives the plane a maximum speed of 110 miles per hour, and a service ceiling of 17,000 feet. The plane is larger, more complex, more heavily powered than comparable Allied types, but flight tests reveal that lower speeds and higher fuel consumption make the Storch operationally inferior to the American L-5. Examination before flight testing showed construction to be excellent throughout. The exceptionally rugged fixed landing gear permits rough takeoffs and heavy landings. On my right here is Steve Hinton, who is a warbird pilot extraordinaire. He's the only pilot that flies a glacier drill. Yeah, give him a big hand. <laughs> and uh, next to Steve is the owner of this beautiful airplane, Rod Lewis. Right. And next to Rod, and here's Bob Carton. He's the guy that got the airplane out of the ice up in the crater. And this last gentleman here is Roy Easterwood, and he's going to talk about flying P 38s in combat in World War II. Right. Could I get another chair up here, guys, please? I was going to sit down here and just have a conversation. It uh, makes it a little bit easier, but we can start off. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't know you were coming. I apologize. Well, let's go back to square one. Uh, 
tell us how this airplane got under 200, over 200 feet of ice, and how'd you get the thing out? Thank you, Dan. Uh, back as uh, we were entering World War II, uh, the main way that uh, U.S. forces were getting their munitions and arms uh, to the European theater, they would put them on ships, and they would sail across the North Atlantic. And uh, the Germans had a nasty habit of sending out submarines and sinking uh, in our shipping. And we were losing about 38% of our war stockage. General Hap Arnold uh, didn't like those numbers. So he uh, directed his staff to come up with an alternate plan. Uh, and what they came up with was, uh, let's fly a little there. And, it, and that was called Operation Bolero. Now, Glacier Girl was part of the second and third the bond flights with these Polaro flights and, and, and their code name was Tomcat Green and Tomcat Yellow. Uh, they left the United States, uh, flew to Presque Isle, Maine, and the command that flew on to uh, VW-8. Today we call that Sonestrom in Greenland. Then early in the morning on July 15th of 1942, uh, six P-38s and two P-17s departed uh, VW-8 they were going to fly across Greenland, uh, land in Iceland, and get some fuel, and continue on uh, to the war zone. Well, as they got about halfway across Greenland, uh, they ran into bad weather, and they were forced to fly into the clouds. And that's when the trouble started, because now they lost their ability to navigate. Uh, now what they were doing is we call dead reckoning, time, distance, and heading, and they just continued on. And, and when they got to the point where they, they felt that they should be close uh, to uh, Iceland, they called the landing instructions, and they received back a coded message uh, that the airport was closed. And uh, hearing that, uh, what they decided to do is to turn and go to their alternate airport at BW-1, and today we call that Nassasarai. And so they, they turned, and they flew for a while, and then they, again they called the landing instructions, and they received back the same coded message. Uh, at that point there, what they decided to do was go back to uh, BW-8 because they knew the weather there was good. So they, they flew up to the northwest on their compasses. And shortly thereafter, the clouds started to break up and they dove underneath the clouds. And they, they found uh, Greenland was there still, but they were kind of confused at this point because the ocean was on the wrong side of Greenland. Uh, they were expecting to end up on the west coast and they were still on the east coast. Now they were very short and low on fuel. They've been airborne for almost eight hours at this point. They uh, talked amongst themselves and they decided that the best thing to do, since there was no airports available for them to get fuel, that they would stay together and actually make a forced landing on the glacier. Now the first man who landed uh, was Brad McManus, and uh, he put his landing gear down and attempted the landing. And as the aircraft lost lift, the nose wheel of the airplane dug into the ice cap, which is snow, and the airplane flipped over on his back. Yeah, the pilots, back it up, he wasn't hurt at all. Uh, the remaining pilots, seeing this, they they made their landings with the gear up. In other words, they fell they landed the airplanes in. Uh, this all took place on July 15, 1942. It's the largest force landing in Air Force history, even through today. There's uh, 25 men involved in the landing, 6P-38s and 2P-17s. Uh, they were on the ice cap for three days until they were located by Navy PBY. And then on the 11th day on the ice cap, a five-man rescue team from the small village of, a uh, fishing village of Amasalik, and that's where they had a weather station, and five men volunteered, risked their lives to save the down flyers. They were, on the 11th day, they walked to the ocean where the Coast Guard ship, the Northland, came and, and picked them up and brought them back to safety. Uh, at that point there, the airplanes were abandoned on the glacier. They just left them there. And after the first winter time, uh, they covered, co covered them with snow. And every year thereafter, the snow would build up and build up and build up on top of it. Now, we went in 1992 uh, to recover Glacier Girl. We were the 13th expedition to go in search of the lost squad. In other words, there's no before us. And over that 50 year period from 1942 to 1992, 268 feet of ice and snow had built up on top of the airplanes. We get on the glacier and we used a GPS and made a very specialized radar to locate the planes. Uh, we melted down on top of it. And 13 weeks later, uh, we had the entire aircraft on the surface. Uh, we rented a big giant helicopter to take the center section off of it. Uh, we uh, 
brought it to our base camp, a place called Blue Soup. Uh, they were put out on a ship and moved it to Middlesboro uh, for restoration. Their cuts arrived in Middlesboro uh, on October 28th of 1992. And at that point there, we started to restore the airplane. Now, since we were going to fly the plane, uh, our plane was fairly simple. We were just going to take it apart until we didn't find any more broken pieces, fix the broken pieces, and put it back together. So we didn't realize how bad the damage it was until we started to take it apart. We just kept taking it apart and taking it apart and taking it apart until uh, about uh, a month and a half later, we had nothing left. We found that every single piece of the plane was broken. And, and now that starts the next 10 years of restoration. Uh, the airplane arrived in October of 92, October of 2002. Uh, Steve Hinton came in and uh, flew the plane for us for the first time. Uh, there's more than 20,000 people, and I know some of you, I see some very, some, a lot of familiar faces here, uh, came to Middlesbrough to watch a fire. Sam? Yeah, that's great, Bob. Thank you. How many people were there? Fast forward, uh, if you would, 65 years, and, and uh, you and Rod and Bob decide you're going to fly that thing over there along the same route it took over the year. What happened? Well, the short story of the thing is uh, uh, Allison Engines, uh, well, let me back up, it broke, okay? Uh, all the preparation and all the uh, uh, thinking and, and work that we had done to try to do this safely. And, uh, it all came to a head right after we took up out of Goose Bay. And uh, what physically broke the engine, we're, we're really not sure of, but we can kind of guess. It, it looks, appears to be a cracked cylinder liner. Um, uh, we have experience with the other P-38. Uh, last year we had 23 Skidoo here, if, you're, if any of you were here. But uh, that's happened twice to me in that airplane. And uh, I couldn't believe my eyes. Uh, the symptoms it, it uh, showed were we were about 150 miles out, I think. We just crossed uh, we, uh, the coast, headed to Greenland, out of Goose Bay, and we were level, and we were cruising along. We were happy, and everything was smooth. And, uh, you know, in a P-38, the big, beautiful engine's out there running. That's part of the personality. Look at the right engine down there, and I see something coming out the vent that's uh, a lot like your car. You know, when it overheats, it blows steam out the radiator cap. Well, it's the same kind of thing with a liquid-cooled Allison. And I, I, I can't believe my eyes, what's happening there? And I look at the coolant temperature gauge and it's 25 degrees below the red line. You know, it's directly linked when it's working properly to the, the temperature. You know, if you're over temperature, your pressure's up and it blows steam off. And I thought I was seeing things, a bank up against a blue sky. I know that's real. And uh, open the coolant door, cool it down, and uh, quit venting. And then I put the coolant door back to get it back to its normal operating temperature and start blowing it out again. Hey Rod, guess what? <laughs> we got to turn around, so we turned our armada around and went back to Goose Bay. But that's the physical problem we think is wrong with the engine. Um, we could have replaced the cylinder banks and carried on, but uh, <clears throat> the other engine on the left side, you know, has flown the exact same amount of hours as the right side, and uh, having experience with a few other P-38s, we just really figured that this side probably was going to do the same thing at some point, so we decided that uh, Rod had already uh, uh, invested in having two new engines overhauled for it anyway, and we were thinking about putting them on before this trip, but uh, uh, we thought, well, we just better in the interest of safety, you know, put two brand new motors on it before we do anything else, so that's, that's why we stopped. Right. what kind of logistics are required to... Uh, undertake an effort like that nowadays. Well, the first thing we did was uh, decided that we better fly this trip in something that can make it over and make it back. So we started out June 5th of this year and did a, a recon trip. And we flew that in the uh, Citation Sovereign. And we actually flew at pretty low altitudes for the Sovereign. We, we took off from Goose Bay and went up to Frobisher Bay spent the night there and then we uh, flew to Sandestrom and then we decided we wanted to go down and see where Glacier Girl actually rested for all those years so we flew to the uh, Kudasuk area. We came came down uh, to a low altitude and we flew over the glacier, got permission from uh, ATC to fly over the glacier at about a thousand feet above the, uh, the altitude which was about 2,500 I believe at, at that point. The glacier starts of course, at sea level, 
and it cools through and then it rises to about 13,000 feet. So we, we had, you know, the weather is just unpredictable there. We uh, wanted to go check out in our saucer rock and we uh, actually shot an approach there and got down to minimums and they just told us it was a 12,000 foot overcast and we were down at 5,900 feet and couldn't see a thing. So we did a missed approach there and then we flew on down to check out the site that the glacier girl rested. But it was a, an amazing, amazing sight to see the um, all the icebergs floating around in, the, uh, in that sea that, what's the name of that sea? Arctic, the North Atlantic, of course. And uh, we messed around there for about 30 minutes, just flew around, we had plenty of fuel. And then we actually went to, to Kulisuk Again, looked at the runway that we were going to land on, which was, I believe, about 3,500 feet long. 3,700 3, feet long. Right, we found, uh, as we were messing around in the Kulisuk area with the, with the Sovereign, we were kind of flying through the the uh, icebergs, and uh, it's pretty mountainous in that area. We flew up a fjord, and there was a an old World War II landing strip called uh, B-1, I believe B-2, B-2. Louis East 2 and uh, actually saw, I don't know, 50,000 barrels of fuel that was sitting along the uh, fjord that, that we hope was used at the time, but the barrels are still there. So this, this is some of the preparation that we did. We actually flew the trip that we were going to fly in the airplane, and then from there we went on to Reykjavik. We basically stopped at every possible airport except, but we did not land in Kulisuk. We didn't land on an unapproved strip, but we landed at every other airport that we might land on during the actual trip. So that's kind of the, the preparation. On, on the Prior to that, we took Glacier Girl into his shop and spent a lot of time and effort just getting the avionics up to speed. We didn't want to change the panel, so we actually put in a 496 that's, that's on a detachable uh, uh, rod or whatever. So he could actually have uh, some good GPS positioning. But, but we actually flew this trip in formation the whole way. And uh, the rest of the trip was flown in formation as well. But, but there was a lot of preparation put into this. And uh, we'll do the, now we're very well prepared for the return trip next year. Thank you. Roy, tell us about your P-38 checkout in World War II. The checkout? Think of it. How did my crew chief check it out? He just gave me the level every time I came back. But, Danny, you checked it out. Hold it, hold it real close. checked it out uh, very thoroughly and uh, made sure that it was going to get us there back uh, as much as we could tell before we took off. Uh, our checkout was really the uh, first time I flew it in combat was my checkout flight. Uh, and uh, everything went along good, no problem. Got back safe and sound. I tell you what, Steve. You know there are issues with every airplane. What's what is the main issue with the P-38? <laughs> the um, you know, it's really easy to fly. I think I mentioned that to you before. It's a uh, uh, pretty comfortable cockpit. Uh, about the only catchy, the, the catch thing I could think about with a 38, and you probably heard the story of the fuel selectors. Uh, and you'll, they're mounted down on the left behind the throttle quadrant here. The one on the left's for the right engine, and the one on the right's for the left engine. That's Lockheed. There you go. And I uh, asked Tony Levere back in the old days why they did that. He said he argued with them too. But there's some regulation, and I didn't understand exactly what he had to say about it, but there's some regulation that we're not going to have to the right engine, the one on the right engine, the engine. You know, the, the master switches for the propellers over here, the one on the left for the left, the one on the right for the right, but uh, I think that fuel selector uh, has caught some people with their pants down a few times. Um, it's caught me before, but I, fortunately it was never in a critical situation, you know. You know, like when you're running a tank dry, you go, you're reaching the red still quit you know, oh, run once you could be a little bit. Um, and then there's the standard thing about why are both engines critical on this thing and that's uh, by design <clears throat> I don't know if you, people have heard it but here again I've never read this but Tony Levere told me that was one of the first questions I asked him to you know why are both engines critical on this you know because 
to do it the way uh, you would, you know, figure it would be a proper way to have both propellers turning in instead of both turning out. He says, well, the first prototype, if you look at the pictures, both props did turn in. But he said, uh, in flight testing, the airplane used too much runway on takeoff. And if you visualize those props rotating, the swirling effect of the uh, air going back, it gave the wrong angle of attack to the leading edge of the inboard section of the wing. And it uh, really didn't create any lift and slow speed on the runway. He said he used way too much runway. So one of the engineers said, well, let's just swap the engines around. And he said, you know, there was a war going on and the production line had already been started, even though the airplane hadn't finished flight test. They swapped it around, cured that problem, and off they went. But really, the airplane is pretty simple to fly. It's got great uh, speed, and it's not what you call a very agile airplane. It's a big airplane. Uh, this is an early model. It was built as an E, and it's but with the uh, installation of the drop tanks, it became an F. Um, it has manual ailerons on the thing. It's really heavy when you get going and when you're flying formation on, you know, in tight formation for an hour or two. Yeah, my, my arm is still sore. Uh, the other 38 you saw on the ramp over there was an L model. It's got hydraulic ailerons on it. Big, big difference. But all in all, it's it's a really really good airplane. I really like it a lot. Well, I'd, I'd love to have the opportunity. Rod, what's your commitment to, as far as air shows and, uh, for Glacier Driven the next few years? Well, I'd, I'd like to back up a little bit on the, the last question uh, on the logistics. First, first thing, something that I missed when I was talking a minute ago is you put the best team of the best guys together. And uh, Steve, Bob, John, all the other guys that were with us were just fantastic. You know, to be with, and they were the most knowledgeable guys around on this particular aircraft, MP-38. So that, that's one thing I wanted to, to mention. But my, back to the second question on the commitment. I own uh, probably several very popular Warbirds now, also bought Rare Bear. It's uh, going to fly, I'm not going to fly, John Penny will fly it at Reno. And some other airplanes that I am flying. Mainly what I'm flying is uh, the TF Mustang that uh, Frank Borman owns and uh, the Bearcat. Sonny uh, Bannock used to really enjoy flying those airplanes. But I'm anxious to get into uh, Glacier Girl, and the commitment is that we, we are going to be hitting uh, as many air shows as uh, Steve and I can get to. He's got a very busy schedule. We, I brought Bob Parton on board with us here just over the duration of this trip decided that, uh, you know, Bob's commitment and dedication to this airplane is just unsurpassed. And I wanted to make sure that I had the most knowledgeable guy to, uh, to continue with the effort. Very, very smart move on your part. So our plans are, I guess the first thing we're going to do, this airplane is not very well known in Texas, so we'll be uh, hitting a few of the air shows. We will be going to Randolph Air, air Force Base Air Show. And uh, we're going to try to get to the Houston. Uh, I don't think we'll make the Midland this year, but we'll try to make it next year. Uh, and, and continue to uh, go to Middlesboro and uh, show her off there because of the, of the dedication of all the folks in that hometown of Glacier Girl was just unbelievable. When I flew in there, we all flew in, and it was just amazing as to the love that people have for this airplane. So. Uh, my intention is not to put it in a hangar and lock it up. My intention is to fly it around and let people enjoy her just like I do, and we all do. I was just going to add something there. It was kind of funny, you know, as we planned this trip, uh, Ed Shipley is a really good friend of ours, an expert pilot, as we all know, Ed B and the Mustang. Uh, we gave him the job of being the uh, PR director, and so Ed got on his uh, website, airshowbuzz.com, and I'm sure a lot of you people were able to follow the mission with us. But uh, what followed us, or what preceded us everywhere we went, we had quite a you know, gathering of uh, interested people. Um, you know, we landed in Presque Isle, Maine, and there was probably about 300 people there waiting for us. And we landed in Goose Bay, and there was probably not a whole lot, but 50 or 60 people. We landed in our Sarsarac at 10.30 at night, and there was 50 people there waiting for us. It's amazing. That's incredible, yeah. So, you know, the airplane's always been well received wherever we take it great story. Uh, Roy has an invitation for you. Right. Uh, another opportunity to be showed off. Uh, our 474th fighter group is reunion in, in San Diego in September on September 12th. We'd love to have a visit so, so that you could come out and take a look at it uh, and, uh, and 
maybe you can see a flyby, but I know that you've got stuff scheduled. I think somebody already talked to Steve about it. You should bring your guys to the Rio Air Races. You can see it there. Well, we're, what, what, I think that uh, could be possibly arranged. We reunion every two years, and I think we'll have probably 55 to 60 of the actual veterans, not pilots, but of the group uh, originally 400 some uh, people. And uh, they'll be meeting, and we meet every two years. Fewer and fewer of us there, but we're there. Uh, our first one was in Minneapolis, 1975, and uh, there was a P-38 brought there by uh, well, from Los Angeles that had a change. Was that you? Were you at that? Great, that was a nice He's everywhere. Yeah, well, they brought it in, and we were able oh, to I'm sorry, 75, and, I thought you said 85. 75, yeah. 75. That wasn't me. No, okay. <laughs> that, was, that was, what, 32 years ago, so. That was Calaché. Calaché, that's right. He brought his P-38 in there. And we had a great time climbing around on it. He let us climb up and get in the cockpit, and he wouldn't let us fly it, though. But uh, <laughs> we did have a good time. Every two years, we could get it. Hey, Bob. Uh, just how authentic is this airplane? That's the real deal. Uh, when, when we, we were very fortunate when uh, we got to Lacey Girl and we started restoring it, we didn't really have a full appreciation for what she was at the time. But as we uh, started to learn more about the airframe, uh, we realized that uh, it was an early model T-38, first of all, and it was the oldest one in the world. And as we started to look at the records, we also realized that uh, the airplane still had, or from the factory, original engines and propellers, and all the armament on the aircraft was the original. So, uh, as we were putting the plane back together, we spent an awful lot of time and effort to ensure the quality and the authenticity of the aircraft. And uh, when we finished the airplane and Steve got it flight for the first time, it was definitely the 1942 World War II P-38, uh, right down to the T. Uh, through the years we've been flying it, we've been to all the major air shows, and again the quality of the restoration uh, allowed us to receive uh, all the big, big awards, the recipient of the Royal Space Aviation Heritage Trophy, Grand Champion Oscars, Grand Champion Southern Fund. So not only do we say it's the best, all of the judges uh, of all the major awards have also said it's the best. How many of you have seen the uh, Dark Knight uh, series on the History Channel? Yeah. How many have seen that? Isn't that the greatest uh, show you've ever seen? I mean, the computer graphics are unbelievable. And our good friend Bud Anderson uh, had the first uh, episode on there with Old Crow, the P-51. Bud, of course, is here. And uh, we did a presentation with Bud and Jack Roush uh, earlier in the week. But uh, dogfights, uh, Bud is one of the uh, uh, advisors to that series. Uh, so I want to ask you, what was it like? What kind of briefing did you get uh, before you went out to fight the Japanese? Well, we always had a briefing uh, of uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes uh, minimum. And uh, we were well informed as to uh, what the target was, where it was, and of course, what weather conditions we could expect, and uh, what we hoped would be the weather when we got back. Uh, but it was a very thorough briefing, uh, keeping in mind that it was in 1944, early 44, and we didn't have all of the good graphics that we have today. But we did have the uh, uh, good pictures, photographs that were very recent of most of the target areas that we were going after. And uh, keep in mind that at that time, from the fall of 44 through the rest of the war, a good deal of our support was uh, ground support. Uh, probably 75% of the mess, uh, miss, uh, missions that we flew were after ground targets, bridges, marshalling yards, railroads, moving traffic, uh, that type of thing. And most, of, most many of that, those took place after we escorted B-26s, met them at a rendezvous, escorted them to their target off, then we'd go off to our target, uh, usually carrying a couple of 500 pound bombs or even a couple of 1,000 pound bombs under the plane. And uh, 
we were on a fighter mission, just playing fighter reconnaissance, we would have a couple of belly tanks under the wings and uh, be out for four or five, maybe up to five and a half hours, uh, which was a long time back in those days, especially at 32,000 feet. That's about the types of mission that we do most of the time. The briefing was always very thorough. And of course, we had a debriefing, every one of us, afterwards with the intelligence officer after we uh, landed and got into the base. How many veterans in the audience? How many veterans? Raise your hand. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. We just lost uh, a good friend, uh, General Robin Olds. Uh, Robin flew P-38s in World War II, and he skipped Korea, became one of the greatest fighter pilots of all time, and went back to Vietnam and was a great leader, but uh, we lost him recently. And I'd like to pay tribute to Robin right now, and also our good friend Tex Hill was supposed to be here this week, but Tex is ill, so tonight, if you would, when you go back to your homes and trailers and campers, uh, have a toast for Robin and Tex, and a little prayer for Tex wouldn't hurt either. So, with that in mind, uh, does anyone have a question for these gentlemen? Uh, there has, in the years past, been several groups wanting to go recover the remaining aircraft, uh, but unfortunately, uh, they haven't been able to get the funding to do so. And. Uh, just remains to be seen if anybody else, you know, belly up their bar and, you know, give a couple million dollars uh, to a group to go uh, recover the remaining aircraft. Anyone else? We're looking at this beautiful plane, and you said that when you got down there, you started taking it apart, all the parts were broken. And as we're looking at this thing, are those all copies of parts? Or are there some original parts on it yet? No, uh, after we took the airplane apart, uh, well, first of all, we saved, we, we had to fabricate about 20% of the airplane. So we saved about 80% of it. Uh, we went to enough detail where we actually literally took the electrical switches apart, cleaned them, and did repairs, and need be even recat plated the metal, and put the switches back together to put it back in the airplane. Uh, we, we, we spent a lot of time doing those kind of things People may say that's stupid, but we were really interested in, in preserving this big piece of history, and uh, we felt it was worth the time and the effort to do so. Got time for about one more question? Yes, sir. I, I just had a question as to uh, the actual flying this airplane in the Pacific, as to what kind of speeds. You mentioned the altitude, but uh, what kind of speeds would you fly, and uh, what was your endurance? And did uh, Lindbergh help you folks uh, learn to fly, extend the range on this plane? Well, I, I can't answer a question in regards to the Pacific. Uh, all of my 50 missions were in Europe, the Ninth Air Force, uh, with uh, France. I, I arrived in England after the invasion. I was a replacement pilot. And uh, my assignment took place in the fall of uh, 44 to the 474th, which just moved from France into Belgium in a base that we had recovered. Uh, but yes, in the case of Lindbergh, he did a lot of experimental flying. It had already been experimented quite heavily by Lockheed and people like Tony Lemire and other test pilots that. Uh, we're trying to determine the best way to get range out of your gasoline supply. And he did do a lot of experimenting with uh, uh, RPM and uh, manifold settings to uh, get the best results. And I can't tell you how much he improved it uh, percentage-wise, but there was a good deal of uh, credit given for that effort. And Tony uh, Beer, Beer was quite a pilot. He did a test course in England uh, one day and because uh, we knew we were going to be a lot of doing a lot of dive bombing and the question is well, what could you do with this plane on dive bombing well he took it up about 10 12 thousand feet and uh, split us right down and pulled it out on the ground level and then uh, he says well i think i was hit about 700 miles an hour at the peak of my speed but he said uh, uh, you could do it and and we did 
but we took a look at the plane after he landed it, and the wings were buckled and a couple of rivets were out of them. So <laughs> that made us be a little more careful after we were doing our own dive bombing. Okay, the last two interviews I've had with you, Steve, I've asked you this question. What's your favorite airplane? And you said the F-86. But I've got another question for you. Okay, is there anything that you haven't flown that you really, really would love to fly? Wow. Uh, actually, a uh, Measurement 262, I think, is probably the, the one airplane that uh, would, would interest me the most. I'd probably walk a mile. <laughs> yeah, I really would love to fly with those. For me, uh, it's a Fokker Wolf 190. I, I think that's a very sexy airplane. But uh, I was talking with Gunther Rall about that recently, and you know, he got to fly everything we had because they had an evaluation section, and, and he says the, the P-51 was the, his favorite airplane. Uh, and the advantages of the P-51 over the ME-109 were amazing. Uh, but he said the biggest thing for him was the starter. It had an electric starter. You know, the 109 had the old crank starter. And it had a 262 and it needs starter too. It had a little uh, uh, two-cycle engine and then like half a quart of fuel. And you just pull started and the bullet of the engine. Yeah, it was, it was a steel chainsaw engine actually. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, that's cool. What about you, right? Is there any airplane that you would like to own or, or have that you yeah, that you don't have? Well, yeah, I have. I don't have a lot of airplanes, but uh, I think kind of the F-5 and the new, newer version of the fighter jet. I'm going to like to fly that someday. <laughs> what about you, Roy? Anything you'd like to fly that you didn't get a chance to? Well, I... Uh, I haven't flown many military planes, uh, 39, 40, 38 is the only military. I've ridden in a couple of jet fighters, just a backseat fighter. But uh, I think that uh, I would like to uh, fly something like the Raptor. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the latest and greatest, man. I think it's awesome. That's what I want. That's what I had when I was flying them, and I would like to do it again. But, man, that's what I believe. <laughs> Well, we need to wrap it up, guys. Uh, anybody have a final comment, Steve? I just want to thank everybody for all their support all the time. And, uh, you know, and I really want to thank Rod here. Rod Lewis has really made a commitment to this airplane and uh, the mission that we went on uh, way above and beyond. Uh, impressed everybody who is unimpressible. So thank you, Rod. And, and of course, Bob, uh, Bob Carton uh, goes without saying, Bob's the greatest guy. I really enjoyed being a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Just a brief announcement here. We're going to try to get the B-17 here, a Yankee Lady, at 11:30. Uh, we're not sure if it's going to fit or not, but if it doesn't, we're going to do an interview out here of the B-17 with Dutch Van Kirk, who was the navigator on Enola Gay. So that should be a really good show for you at 11.30, either here or out there. Uh, I want to thank you guys uh, on behalf of Warbirds of America for coming today. Uh, really appreciate it. We'll see you here next year. Have a good day at Air Venture.